right. That's a wonderful song that we just sang. How great is our God. <coughs> And some you referred to uh, use the term indescribable a few times. That reminds me, have many of you seen, it's out in a DVD uh, by Louis Giglio, the indescribable, looking at the stars and planets and outer space and really glorifying God. Um, and this song, this chorus goes with it. Is it by Chris Tomlin? Yeah. And I think years ago in Hillsong Conference, had the privilege of hearing both of them. I think it was together. So it's an indescribable experience. So, um, and that is a great introduction to uh, the indescribable book of Revelation. So I mentioned, I think, a couple of times in the recent past that um, I felt to um, start looking at the book of Revelation in some detail, and that's what I'm now planning to do from now on. Um, having got a strict plan on how many weeks we'll do it, and we'll see how we go. Some of you may remember that um, I looked at my old notes and cheated from them a bit. I think it was in October of last year. I did have um, one uh, topic here, which I think I called approaching revelation. I didn't want to call it introduction to revelation because it wasn't meant to be really an introduction as such. That's what I want to do today, and it'll probably flow over to next week as well, an introduction to the book of Revelation. And um, looking at that and then going on um, uh, week by week, um, you uh, will notice in this month's program that I'm set down to share the message every week. Um, the leadership team did sort of caution me a bit and wanted to give me some breaks, but I was a bit stubborn, a stubborn Finn and thought that including in two weeks, um, as Sami noted, we'll have an all-church combined meeting uh, with an Israel theme. So a little bit uh, before we were discussing that, I just felt uh, in my mind that, hang on a minute, um, actually I should really talk about Israel and the church at that meeting, and particularly from the viewpoint of um, different um, ways that the church has understood and still understands the role of Israel and the role of the church and from the point of view and that's got a lot of relevance and a lot of significance in terms of how we understand the end time events and um, interpret also the book of Revelation so I think that'll be timely uh, and a bit different but ties in with this uh, theme on the book of Revelation um, yeah um, must be close to a year and a half ago, whatever, once the pandemic really kicked in, I started feeling that I should really prepare something on Revelation and study it for myself and be good to sort of share something with the church. And that's why I kind of did that um, initial approach to Revelation and um, then um, haven't felt the time to be right until now. Earlier in the year, as you remember, we looked at the basis of our faith and the foundations and laying them secure building on firm foundations, then the role of the Holy Spirit, and including the gifts of grace. And now I've sort of felt uh, that it's time to start looking at um, the book of Revelation in earnest and what God wants to speak to us through it. Um, it's been said that the book of Revelation is the most difficult book in the Bible, and um, I say a wholehearted amen to that, particularly when I've been over the last quite a few weeks I've been focusing on the book of Revelation and uh, studying various resources which I've uh, been able to obtain, which has been really good and beneficial, but gee, things get confusing. You read one godly author and their viewpoint, say, oh yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Then you read another one, an equally godly uh, Bible-fearing um, author, and they say something quite different. Okay, well, that makes sense, etc., etc. So it is challenging, and I do not pretend that I've come up with a solution to all that, and I've got, I've got the answer. No, I don't, uh, and I'm still studying And as we go on. Um, and I pray to God, and I hope that you will pray with me, that God, through his Holy Spirit, will reveal or help our understanding as we study the book of Revelation, which is a challenging book. Someone mentioned a few weeks ago to me that the first part's good, and the last part's good, but the middle... I don't get. 
or join the club. <laughs> but um, I won't get in today, uh, hopefully next week, have a brief look at the different approaches or different ways that people view and interpret the book of Revelation, but that's also where a lot of the confusion comes in. Um, however, it is a book of Revelation meant for us, and uh, God has given it deliberately for the church. You may recall the, in um, the Old Testament, um, the book of Daniel, um, he was given uh, with one of his later uh, revelations that uh, seal the prophecy of this book, because that's meant for the end time. So Daniel was meant to seal, to close, to close it off. Whereas to John, uh, in the book of Revelation, towards the end, um, it says that do not seal the prophecy of this book, because it is for now. And now has now gone for about 2,000 years. So it is definitely a book for us. And God's intention is that we read it and we understand it. We've got two opposite extremes as the church, and that continued to happen. Uh, and still does, we can get overly excited and enamored uh, on the symbols and the descriptions and beasts and numbers and 666 and whatever, and start really going through Revelation uh, with a sort of a looking for uh, hidden clues and things, and um, we can get, be, really be led astray. On the other extreme, um, we may say that it's too hard and too confusing and no one seems to know what it's all about, so I'll ignore it. And unfortunately, the church has done the latter quite a bit. And um, I did read somewhere um, that something to the effect that um, pastors are remiss if they do not preach from the book of Revelation to their church. It is part of the Bible, God's revelation, the whole revelation to his people, which we are now his church, both Old Testament and New Testament, and through the Holy Spirit guarding, God has guided what is included between these covers. I'm not talking about the index and etc., but the actual word of God, of course. And that includes the book of Revelation. So it is the word of God for us. So we are meant to read it, and not just to read, but we are meant to get from it. To be clear from the outset, uh, we cannot know the time of Jesus' is coming. And also, if you are hoping that, okay, Kari has been studying this now for a few weeks, so he'll give the final answer on, is Jesus coming before the tribulation or after or whatever and what it all means. Sorry to disappoint you. No, I don't. Um, but we'll go through together and look at um, the, the various approaches. And um, in due course, I do want to go through the whole book uh, and probably focus on one or two key approaches and make some notes on some alternate views. And um, let's keep praying that God will enlighten our understanding through his Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, um, God has given us the book of Revelation. And that helps to show us how the course of history in the world will actually unfold. It is not meant to be a secret for us. And we shouldn't get into all sorts of knots uh, trying to make all sorts of fanciful interpretations to it. Okay. Um, some highlights. Um, the book of Revelation shows that God is sovereign and he is the majesty over all kingdoms and powers, and uh, uh, including the powers of the evil one. God is sovereign over history. and he, he lets things go thus far, but no further when he draws the line. Um, and also, the book of Revelation gives a clear idea, regardless of where we understand um, that Jesus will come for us, for his own, the church will face persecution and trials and difficulties. And we need to be prepared for it. But it also shows that God is in control and he doesn't leave us alone. It is true that at this time in history, it is said, and those who studied it, there's more persecution of Christians than ever before. We may not really be feeling it. We may not feel that we are being particularly persecuted. Well, we're not um, in certain ways. In some ways, I think it's increasing. But um, certainly the worldwide church, the global church, there is a lot of persecution and people giving their lives for Christ. And we do well to remember them in our prayers and uh, pray for God to 
be with them and give them his encouragement, his support, including from the book of Revelation and um, the insight that we can get from there. So we are called to be witnesses of Jesus, no matter what, and stand firm. And therefore, the big challenge in the book of Revelation is to stand firm, hold your ground, hold on to what you have. So we need to keep um, and take, uh, take note of the prophecy of Revelation. And indeed, I've selected a verse, we'll read it shortly, um, or similar verse shortly rather, uh, but in this month's program, and the front cover, about I am coming soon. And we need to keep, uh, take a hold of the word of the prophecy. And we need to study it with the guide of the Holy Spirit to help our understanding and what it all means and what does it mean for us today as a church of God here in Australia or wherever people are listening to this. Now, the way I want to approach this, I'm not going to give a clear outline on, on week one we do this, week two we do this. But uh, in broader terms, today and next week, um, we'll go through some of the initial verses of, um, of the book, in the first chapter, and then I want to sort of take a bit of a break and look at some of the background to the book of Revelation and um, the different ways of approaching, which will be next week, and the structures, uh, how the book can be broken down so we can see some clear blocks um, of flow in the, in the scripture. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, in two weeks, we'll look at the roles of Israel and the church. And uh, then uh, after that, I want to start going through section by section uh, through the book, so suitable uh, paragraphs or sections, and look at how it can be understood and what they speak to us. And I won't go through verse by verse. I mean, in some cases, it will be verse by verse. If I did a literal verse by verse, that it will be here well into next year. Having said that, I think some pastors have taken two or three years to preach through the whole book of Revelation to their church. So breathe easy. I'm not planning to do that yet. No. <laughs> so we'll try to move on, um, but still um, pay enough uh, time and um, uh, attention to hear what God wants to speak to us through it. There will be also comparisons with um, Old Testament prophecies in uh, different bits where they fit in, by no means in all relevant bits, uh, because the book of Revelation actually refers a lot to the Old Testament. But um, some of the um, prophecies there, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, are helpful in understanding what's written in the book of Revelation. And also what Jesus spoke um, in his... Um, speech or discourse on Mount Olivet a little bit before his suffering. Now, someone's uh, kind of written like, or re rewritten almost what you could write a title page for the book of Revelation. Thus, the revelation belonging to Jesus Christ, the word of God, and the testimony from Jesus, written by his slave John, written for Jesus' slaves. So that's a bit of a interesting way of putting it. Um, the translation that I'm mainly using, New American Standard Bible, instead of slave, is using bond servants. Other translations just talk about servants of God, and we'll come to uh, that uh, more also later. But the challenge for us is to be, are we willing to be bond servants or slaves of God, voluntary slaves, and take the message that he wants to give us and listen to it and put it into practice. Now, let's read verses 1 to 3 from the first chapter. And a couple of quick notes on that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which, which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed to the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Things which must soon take place, for the time is near. So through the book of Revelation, this theme does keep coming through, and I'll come back to it a bit more later, about it being close, it will be near when Jesus comes. 
unpacking that for now. The revelation is, when you just read it properly, it is actually the revelation of Jesus. It's a revelation which belongs to Jesus. God gave him the revelation, which he then passed on to John. Um, and then John, it's interesting, he says he testifies to what he saw. So, so it's an eyewitness account. John was shown, shown these marvelous, and we could say, I think, quite fairly indescribable visions and heard indescribable voices from what is going to be happening in the future and in the heavenly kingdom. And he tried to write them down. It comes to also our understanding of um, inspiration of scripture. Was John in some sort of a trance and he was just given to write down verbatim? I don't think so. The other extreme, I'm sort of jumping around here a little bit. We'll come to the background shortly, but I'll talk about it now. The other idea is, which does come across from quite many um, uh, authors um, who are looking at and explaining the book of Revelation, and almost I start to get the funny feeling that it's all like a human sort of construction. That John knew his Old Testament, so he knew uh, the word pictures that Ezekiel was uh, using, or Daniel's visions, or what Zechariah said, etc. So he put all these together to mold it. Um, I'm not sure if that's making any sense. If it doesn't, don't worry. Cause I don't think that's quite how it works. I do have a, if you like, a higher view of the inspiration of Scripture, including the book of Revelation. That John actually wrote down what he was shown. Yes, there are a lot of similarities or parallels and some differences to what some of the Old Testament prophets saw. But that's what he was shown. It wasn't just John being clever and putting, you know, like you know, preparing an essay for school or uni that you use you know, 10 books and take snippets here and there and make it your own. No, um, sure, he may have been influenced uh, and would have been influenced by the Old Testament writings and prophets, but he was writing down what he saw as an eyewitness, as a credible witness. I saw, and he assured uh, the readers right at the beginning that he wrote down what he saw and heard. And that's what he saw. In a number of places, he described these indescribable visions like such and such, something like, or in the form of. So, okay, he was struggling to describe. And we ever tried writing a paragraph about a scene or beautiful view. And even if you're a good writer, I think it's challenging. And there's that funny game that we sometimes play at, play at New Year's with my sister's family. The first person, oh, how did it go? Someone um, draws something, whatever, and folds the paper, gives to the next person, and then that person needs to write what they saw, and they fold the paper, and the next person gets the writing, and they need to draw what they read and so on. And by the time you go through 12 people, look at what was originally shown and what was the end result was way different. It's good fun and doesn't take too much brain wave. But it's difficult, challenging to describe. So we certainly need to take that in, in view. But he was an eyewitness and testifying. So he was giving a testimony what he saw. I think I made the point. Then in um, verse 3, that one, we have the first of seven occurrences of, of the word blessing or pronouncement on blessing to someone. And here, the blessing is for someone who reads, who hears, and who takes note or takes to heart or obeys the word of the prophecy. Now, back in the time of John, and um, the book of Revelation was primarily sent as a letter to the seven churches in um, uh, Asia, Asia Minor in modern Turkey. And most of those churches, maybe all of them, don't exist anymore. I think there's a church in Ephesus now, but I think there's been a gap. But um, anyway, a lot of the congregation there were quite poor. Many of them were slaves, so not many of them were able to read. So picture this, when they get this letter, 
and other New Testament letters, someone from the front will be reading it. And people aren't following from their own Bibles because they didn't have it. They were listening and paying attention. And I'm sure there was then some explanation and etc. Um, an exhortation and then trying to keep it. In fact, some translations say that um, those who read loud. And in fact, I think in some churches they've tried reading the whole book of Revelation out loud. I was joking this morning, maybe we should set a Saturday afternoon that we all come together and take turns reading a chapter. and take a few hours to read through the whole book. And uh, I think that would actually be quite rewarding. Um, but uh, short of doing that, uh, can I encourage us all to read the whole book of Revelation in the one sitting? When you've got a bit of time, it takes a couple of hours, depending on how fast you read. What you can do, and I've referred to this in past, uh, in different ways of reading the Bible, you could read, because most of the modern Bibles have little helpful subheadings, whether they are all in the right spot or etc., never mind. The quick way to read would be to skim through all the subheadings. It probably takes you 20 minutes. And you get a big, uh, big picture. And have some idea on the overall canvas, what's before us. And then go back. And when you've got a couple of hours, just go through, read everything. Just keep going, keep going. I mean, uh, often it's temptation when you're sort of studying the word, there's a verse or two that really speaks to you, so you start really looking at that, and that's great. But we also, this is not and or, this is um, combination. Um, we, want to, we should use different methods of reading the Bible. So we can understand a verse or two much better. When we know the, have read the whole book, we know the context where that sits in. And the same goes with the book of Revelation, where all these visions and seals and trumpets and whatever, they fit in in the whole um, scene, the whole drama, if you like. So the first um, call of someone being blessed is that. Reading, hearing, and taking to heart to obey. Revelation has um, the number seven occurring many times. And I don't want to get into funny numerical things, but certain numbers do have a clearly established symbolic value. And the number seven is the number for completeness, or God's number also, but completeness. So I didn't put a slide on where the other seven blesseds are in the Revelation. Um, you're not taking notes. I can list them to you, but maybe not. <laughs> you haven't got a pen and paper. I can give them to you later if you want. Um, but it's interesting to also look at those seven benedictions or seven blessings and who the book uh, calls blessed. All right. For the time is near, as I mentioned before and referred to it. Now, for the last 2,000 years almost, Christians have been waiting for Jesus to come back. And he still hasn't come back. So were they all wrong? Was Paul wrong in clearly seeming to expect that Jesus is coming back in his lifetime? It seems that way. Although in then the second Timothy, he realized that his life is now about to be cut short. I've completed the race. Um, I've uh, been faithful and now the reward is waiting for me in heaven. And Jesus hadn't come. And he still hadn't come. So... People have been wondering, okay, what is this soon or near um, all about? Because it's been, Jesus has been coming soon for the last 2,000 years. I don't think I've got a comprehensive, thorough explanation for it. But the fact is that God's timing is different to ours. And um, also, I think there's a reason for God actually delaying the culmination of the history of the world. And Peter uh, gives an um, insight into this in 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, uh, which I think is useful to keep in mind. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So, um, even so, sort of studying the further on in Revelation, God is giving the chance 
for people to turn around and repent, including through these horrible judgments. Now, whether we are going to be here part of it or not, I'm not getting to that now. But the people who are there, through those terrible judgments, God is still trying to call them into repentance. But time and time again, in the vision John saw, but they did not repent. But they did not repent. Like in the time of Israelites um, escaping Egypt, God hardened the heart of uh, Pharaoh. And he kept saying, yes, you can go. No, you can't. Yes, you can go. No, you can't. No, you can't go. Um, and the judgments got more and more severe. God is in his grace still going to be trying to draw people to repent. But unfortunately, a lot of people will not. And then finally, God draws um, a line, uh, enough, and things will culminate. Now, let's go through verses 4 to 8 briefly. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, the greeting uh, that John started writing um, quickly turns to praise. As he starts to look at um, and... Uh, is close to God. Uh, later on, we, read, we won't read it today. He was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, so probably on a Sunday. And he was praying, worshipping, and then he started getting these visions. And the first thing, he gives praise to God, the Almighty, and Jesus Christ. And how fitting today, we've commemorated um, communion and um, reminded ourselves again about the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. That's what John is doing at the start of the book. And he describes Jesus in, it can be seen as seven different ways, as we just read through, if you go through it, and that's kind of a summary of it. So lots of uh, different descriptions of Jesus. And if that doesn't cause us to praise him, then what does? In fact, it's been said that when you're reading the book of Revelations, if that does not cause you to praise and worship God, well, then you haven't read it properly. Yes, there are a lot of judgments and dark chapters, but when you focus on the praise and worship, the choirs and heavenly multitudes in heaven, praising God, singing praises to him, and describing why they are praising him, what he has done, beautiful, magnificent are all your works. They are perfect, and you saved us. And the slain lamb, he was worthy to open the seals. That's Jesus Christ. He was slain for our sins, and he has washed our sins to make us priests and kingdom for his Father. So praise God. And may God help us as we go through the book of Revelation to uh, focus on uh, lifting our eyes to Jesus and what he has done and what God is doing through history. And we are called to be his witnesses. So it starts with the common greeting that Paul used in his letters, grace and peace. So what a wonderful greeting to the persecuted church. As you know, when you've read it all, we will see the seven churches in Asia Minor that John is particularly writing the letter to. They were facing persecution and about to face more. But grace and peace. That reminds us again. Let's never forget, it is by the grace of God we, we are here. His enormous grace, God gave his only son to take away our sins. And through that, we can have peace. Not of our own making or through our own efforts, but he gives us peace, even in the middle of uh, challenges or uh, persecution. God is also praising God the Father, Almighty Father. 
And there are a couple of descriptions that we notice here. The Lord who was and is and is to come. So the God who spans time from eternity to eternity. He is there. He is constant. He is present. He deserves all our praise. So it's lifting our eyes to some magnificent, indescribable visions of God and uh, his heaven and what his work. And then also um, it occurs uh, two or three times in Revelations, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I think most of us know, okay, they are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. But those who understand the uh, culture behind it, they describe that, okay, that actually means not just the first letter, the beginning and the end, but also everything in between. So again, reminds us of God being almighty. He is in control of all of history, not just the start of it, just kick-starting the universe and say, good luck, and I'll put an end to it here and make a new heaven and new earth. No, he is there, constant. Almighty God, all-powerful God, overall majesty and power. And he's the one that gives these visions and um, gives us cause to praise him. And Jesus uh, then was called to be, oops, no, not there yet, a witness. Um, and even, I'll skip it a little bit, uh, but even in his time on earth, he was testifying to what he had seen and given from God. And even uh, Pilate, uh, when he was questioning him, asked uh, whether he's a king. And uh, Jesus said that, yes, for this reason I have been born and come to this world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, the word testify in Greek, and I'm not wanting to go into lots of Greek words, and I don't pretend to know Greek. I know Greek from what I've read from other people's, what they wrote. But some words are quite interesting. So the word for testify is martus, from which we get the word martyr. So testify, martyr. Oh, funny connection. And unfortunately, as I referred to before, there are many of our brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, who their testimony of Jesus also become martyrs, give their lives because of their testimony. Jesus was the first one, faithful witness, and he died. Well, he was the first martyr, really. But he died, he gave his life. No one could take it from him to, for a totally different reason, to pay for our sins, as we know. So all this is a really powerful reminder of us, for us of Jesus' work and his sacrifice for our sins. Now, background. I took this from the NASA website. One of the photos they put up recently of the new James Webb telescope. Louis Giglio had a lot of photos from the Hubble telescope. Um, and now we're getting very different views or from much further out into the distant galaxies and universes using infrared technology, etc. It's just fascinating. So I thought that's quite apt when we're thinking about the book of Revelation. We are talking about uh, a really fantastic, kind of out of this world things of God and let that encourage and uplift us. One more Greek word, apocalypsis, which actually means to reveal something that has been hidden or unveil. A bit like if you go to the cinemas at the start, or well, it's usually the ads, not the shows, the curtain will open up to reveal the screen. Or if you go to a play, not that I've gone to plays, but performances. So unveiling, revealing what's been hidden and what hasn't been known, and, and to disclose it. Um, now. Worth mentioning this, uh, Apocalypse, it is in the sense that the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book. It's not in the same sense as the apocalypse, apocalypse the movie, or the whole current genre of um, end time scary things, bits and pieces. So let's not confuse the book of Revelation with that type of thing. And also, when you read some of the background literature from about 200 before Christ, 200 after, or vice versa, um, there was a whole Jewish genre of literature which was called apocalyptic literature. And um, it's in a lot of ways different 
to what John's writing is. But that word is there, so it can be a bit confusing, and we may be tempted if you read into, or go to Bible school or whatever and read those things, might be confused or tempted to think that, okay, this is the same as uh, those, basically they were fantastic stories. It's not God's revelation. So this um, book of Revelation is something quite different. Just to note. <coughs> And um, I won't go into too much detail. God gave the, re it is the revelation of Jesus. It belongs to Jesus, his revelation, which God gave to him to pass on through his angel to John, who passed on then to the churches. And indeed, the letter was written in the first instance, and you can't see that, and don't worry about the writing. This is a corner of Turkey, modern Turkey, and that was called the Near Asia or Asia in Roman's day. The Isle of Patmos, where John uh, was imprisoned, is there, and that's where he received his visions. And the letters were then sent to the churches going around in this sort of a loop, clockwise loop, to the seven churches in Asia. Um, there are disputes over when the book of Revelation was written. It seems to me to be the most uh, fitting uh, that it was written around 95 um, AD, uh, towards the end of the reign of the Emperor Domitian. Um, other th people take the view that it was written around the time of Nero or soon after uh, Nero's death um, in the 60s. And then also the, a lot of those people then see a lot of what's written in Revelation to be fulfilled at the fall of the Jerusalem Temple in 70 AD and um, etc. So um, I don't sort of think that really fits in too well. Other thing to note just quickly about the background. I mentioned that I'll be referring to the Old Testament a number of times. Um, scholars say that there are over 200 references or allusions to Old Testament in the book of Revelation, more than in any other New Testament book. And depending on how you look at it, uh, some say even a lot more. So there are hundreds of references of different types to the Old Testament. So it's well founded um, also or in keeping with what God had revealed to his prophets in the Old Testament. So surprise, surprise, God is consistent what he shows uh, to his servants. So the purpose, um, it dawned on me yesterday that, hang on, just simply, the purpose of the book of Revelation is written right at the beginning to show the things that much soon take place. To, sh to show us, the church, what will soon happen. That's the key purpose. Um, and that helps to keep, make us ready and be prepared for whatever is to come. Um, and, oh yes. Uh, for us to stand firm in our witness of what Jesus um, has called us to do even in the face of uh, persecution. Now, in the current age, um, whilst we may not be faced with the death penalty for believing in the Bible, but there is an increasing trend of opposition or non-acceptance of the biblical message, as you would have seen. Um, in the weekend, Australian, I noted last weekend, there were quite a number of articles and issues which really were highlighting that and different things in the current uh, climate where you know, acceptance, tolerance, etc., cetera, um, is all in vogue. And in, in principle, that's a good thing. But um, not accepting true Christian witness or the message of the Bible. That's not acceptable, increasingly so. But everything else is. Because we say, yeah, the Bible says, Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life. If we claim that, then we are being intolerant in some people's, in many people's view. So we need to be ready and be prepared to stand firm. The truth in love. God loves the worst of sinners that we would, in the flesh, we would sincerely hate. But God still loves them. But he hates the sin. So we need the mind and character of God, particularly when we are standing firm at this day and age. 
Yes, we show God's love to people regardless. But we stand firm on the foundation of God's word. May God help us. Sorry, I'm taking a bit long. I won't go into details. What type of uh, writing is uh, Revelation? And it's been three types have been described. It's a bit of a combination of all, and different people have take different view on what's most. With the apocalyptic type writing, uh, people can get into very much into symbolism and interpret everything as symbols, and you can really go overboard and go well beyond what's written. The letter clearly says it's a letter. John wrote a letter to the seven churches, so in part it is a letter. It starts like a letter and finishes like a letter, but most of it actually is prophecy. And uh, written as prophecies that uh, John saw and passed it on. Um, by the way, um, there's also a controversy about uh, which John, who was John who wrote it. My understanding it is that, as we've understood for a long time, that um, it is the Apostle John, son of Zebedee, who leaned on Jesus' chest um, at the time of the Last Supper. He was probably actually quite a young man, probably well under 20. And now he was an old man in his 90s when God gave him these visions, and he probably didn't live much longer after that. Other people think that's another John, and couldn't be that John, and blah, 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 but I think it's the same John. Um, he doesn't introduce himself as the Apostle John, but the early church history um, also confirms that the Apostle John, the Beloved, was given fantastic visions on the Isle of Patmos, etc. So at the time of um, John's time, uh, the Christians were facing increasing persecution. Things were getting more difficult, and after that they got even more difficult. Yes, there was Roman persecution at the time of Nero, which I understand was earlier than what John was writing, but it certainly wasn't worldwide, it wasn't uh, all across uh, the Roman Empire. During the reign of Domitian, it got wor worse and worse after that. Romans, otherwise, mostly that period was a time of Roman peace, the glory days of the Roman Empire. Um, apart from conquering uh, tribes and people and like destroying the Jerusalem of Jem Temple in AD 70, uh, and the whole city of Jerusalem, the worst sort of flattening and um, destruction of a city, I think, ever in history. Um, but overall, um, the Romans were relatively tolerant and let people of other tribes or nations um, have their own religion. And particularly the Jews for a long time had special privileges, so they were exempt from worshipping the emperor, which was starting to come in. And emperors wanted to be worshipped as you know, God, um, which clearly you can't do as a Christian. So the Jews were exempt and under that banner, uh, Christians for a while. But then the Jews started to say that, hang on, these Christians, they're not Jews. And indeed, many of them were not. They were Christians from non-Jewish backgrounds. And uh, even um, the Jews were persecuting the Christians. So they lost, with time, the special privileges that Jews had and were expected to take part in worship of the emperor and also worship of the Roman gods. And what made things challenging, and I want to finish with this, and sorry to take a bit longer. If you were a tradesperson, you were expected to, or you needed to belong to a trade guild or a trade organization. And as part of that, being a member of your organization, you had to take part in, in sacrifices to whatever gods, the god of that trade or whatever, and even emperor worship. And if you didn't take part, well, you couldn't be part of that um, trade organization. It's not like, not talking about trade organizations here uh, in the modern day, but there, if you weren't part, then you couldn't sell your products or you couldn't carry out commerce. So it was a serious thing. So again, reminds us, of the increasing expectations in today's society that we ought to toe the line, even if it's not to do with trade unions, I'm not talking about trade unions, I'm not saying anything for or against them, but the society expectations 
and I thought of it, there are some subtle signs. Um, I won't go into details. I think you can hopefully guess what I'm referring to. In my previous job, you know, in a lot of workplaces, you have your ID on a lanyard. So there were the formal, official lanyards, which just said the name of the organization, blah, blah, blah. And that's what I chose to wear till the end. We were given other lanyards, which were more showing cultural support, including, and some people are smiling here, they know exactly what I'm talking about, including the nice rainbow colored one. And again, I say this with all respect. I kept my rainbow lanyard in my drawer. I never used it because I don't want to show directly or indirectly support for something that it represents. I may have been seen as intolerant. I don't know. Seems like a simple thing, and I wasn't persecuted for it. Um, I was kind of dreading a bit whether some of my colleagues were a bit vocal, whether they're going to pick on that, but no, they didn't. So don't want to make too much out of it. But there are these subtle things happening in society where we're expected to show that we support this or that or whatever idea and particularly with this sort of woke culture and uh, so and so let me not go there or the cancel culture etc so there are signs and symbols which are coming in our society which are subtle i think what we see in the book of revelation is um, some of it um, has been fulfilled earlier and some of the signs we are seeing happening now but that's not the final fulfillment yet there are partial sort of like introductory tones and the Bible says that many antichrists has already come, like one of the letters. And there are many, many antichrists, but they weren't the one that the book of Revelation talks about later on. So we need care and inspiration of the Holy Spirit to understand correctly and appropriately the book of Revelation without going into unhelpful extremes and weird doctrines. So sorry for the rush. And we will finish there for today and continue more next time, a bit more in the background, and we'll, we'll move on. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your whole Bible, your whole word for us, including the book of Revelation, Lord. And my prayer is that even through these rushed few thoughts, you will help your church, your congregation, all the listeners, Lord, and really take that and what's written in your word and make it alive for us. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, who is living in us, and one of his tasks is to explain the word of God to us, Lord, and remind us of your truth and what you have taught in your word. Lord, we pray your anointing for our study on the book of Revelation, your anointing for the week ahead for the whole congregation, including those who are listening um, online, Lord, now or later on. Be with us and remind us again and again, Lord, that indeed we need to lift up our eyes to you, Lord, who've Sacrifice so much to give us the indescribable gift of your salvation and freedom to live in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.